It is the aftermath of Cannae. 60 to 70,000 Roman soldiers are now dead on the field. To match this level of death in a day, you'd have to compare it to the devastation of the atomic bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. The Roman soldiers who escaped the carnage rallied to the city of Canusium to the south. They are led by the sole surviving consul, Marcus Terentius Varro. Amongst these men is a junior officer named Publius Cornelius Scipio. He is the son of the wounded consul who shares the same name, the man who tasted defeat and near death at the hands of Hannibal at the river Ticinus. It is now the young Scipio's turn to understand what it means to fight the great Carthaginian general, whose undefeated army now appears invulnerable. But yet, in this darkest hour for Rome, his energetic mind ponders the military genius that he has just witnessed, the audacity of a quick attack, the cunning of a double pincer, and the terrifying use of encirclement that has given the Republic its greatest defeat. He wonders if there will be a day when a Roman general will be able to wield such tactics. As the defeated army of the Republic makes its way back to Rome, the Senate gets distressing news. Word of the great Roman defeat has made its way across the entire Mediterranean, and the results are disastrous. In the east, Philip V of Macedonia has declared war and seeks an alliance with Carthage. The Gauls in the Po Valley have risen up and destroyed two Roman legions, killing their leader and hollowing out his skull to make a drinking cup. The second largest city in Italy, Capua, has defected to Hannibal's cause, and soon the Carthaginian general will also take the city of Tarentum as well. To the south, Sicily has become a war zone once again as a pro-Carthaginian faction has taken control of Syracuse and with the help of the great scientist and mathematician Archimedes has turned the city into a fortress. There are uprisings in Corsica and Sardinia and far to the west in Hispania, new Carthaginian armies are being raised in Carthago Nova. Surprisingly, Hannibal did not march on Rome at this time. He made a grave strategic error. He figured after this many defeats, the Republic would be eager to get to the negotiating table and end the war. In this decision, he is very much wrong. Instead, Rome uses the time to field new armies. Within a year, the Senate has enough manpower to wage a multi-front war. In one of these offensive actions, the Senate dispatches the ex-consul and father of our young refugee from Cannae, Publius Cornelius Scipio and his brother Gnaeus, to Spain. Gnaeus had already gone ahead, where he landed at Emporia and had moved on to establish his headquarters at Taraco. Here, he defeated a Carthaginian army at the Battle of Sissa in 218. By 215, Gnaeus is joined by his brother Publius Scipio, and the two men build up their army and march out to fight the Carthaginians who are under the command of Hannibal's brother, Hasdrubal. Hasdrubal had it in mind to march his new force all the way to Italy to join up with his brother. But the Scipio brothers, the Scipi, have something else in mind, and the two forces meet near the mouth of the Ebro River. In the ensuing Battle of Ibera, Hasdrubal attempts to recreate his brother's maneuvers at Cannae, but instead, the battle goes horribly wrong for him. Hasdrubal's cavalry fails to drive their opponents from the field. His infantry doesn't do much better, and at the critical moment, his center shatters and breaks. It becomes a rout. And on this day, the House of Scipio will claim victory. The Romans continue to press the offensive, and in 212, retake the city of Saguntum. Encouraged by their successes, Publius and Gnaeus Scipio decide to invade the heartland of Carthaginian Spain. They know that the strategic scene has changed. The Carthaginian high command, well aware of the Scipio brothers' triumphs in the Iberian Peninsula, have sent in two armies to reinforce Hasdrubal. These two armies were initially scheduled to leave to back up Hannibal in Italy. But instead, Hannibal's other brother Mago and a fellow Carthaginian named Hasdrubal Gisco arrive in Spain. The Scipio hire local mercenaries to bolster their numbers, and in 211, they march in. The Roman brothers manage to make their way deep into the interior, 
but when they discover that the Carthaginian forces are dispersed, they make the disastrous mistake of dividing up their own forces. Publius takes his men in pursuit of Mago, but as he arrives in the upper Beatus River Valley, he realizes that he is being closed in on by not just Mago, but also by all of his mercenaries who know the terrain. Mago has convinced the Iberian chieftain, Idibolus, and the Numidian prince and esteemed cavalry commander, Massinissa, to join him. The three forces circle around the Romans. Massinissa, with his quick cavalry, harasses the legions on a daily basis. Publius attempts to fight his way out of the trap, but Massinissa finally rushes in for a flanking attack, pinning the Romans, who are then assaulted by the Carthaginians from all sides. When the dust settles, the Roman force is wiped out, and Publius is dead. His brother Gnaeus does little better. He goes in after Hasdrubal with his Celt Iberian mercenaries, feeling like he's got the advantage when it comes to numbers. But Hasdrubal, knowing that the loyalty of these mercenaries is basically up for grabs, has already bribed them to leave. Gnaeus now finds himself completely outnumbered and takes up a final stand on a hill known as Elorca. He does this as the combined forces of Hasdrubal, Mago, Gisco, and Massinissa close in. He, like his brother, is killed alongside his valiant Romans. In the ongoing fight between Rome and Carthage fought between the House of Barca and the House of Scipio, it is the Barcas who now claim victory. Back in Rome, the war continues to rage on, on multiple fronts. Hannibal has even marched on the great capital. But the Roman perseverance to continue the fight is only stronger. When news of the defeat and the deaths of the brothers Scipio reach the Senate, a call immediately goes out to see who will continue the war in Hispania. No one answers. Most of the aristocracy and military leaders were wiped out at Cannae. There are very few left, and of those that remain, no one is eager to go to Spain, which is considered one of the most dangerous fronts. And then one day, one man answers the call. Publius Cornelius Scipio, the son of the slain commander, the man who at Cannae saw what the Carthaginians can do, steps forward. Initially, the Senate rejects him as he's too young, too inexperienced, and too brash, but the young man sidesteps the Senate, and by invoking one of the other voting assemblies, the Comitia Censurata, he secures his command, and with a newly raised force, he sets off for Spain. The young Scipio arrived in Hispania in the year 210 at the port of Emporia. With his troops, he moved on to Taraco, which was the last major stronghold that the Romans had in the peninsula. This was a base that the Carthaginians had neglected to overrun, which they soon discovered was a mistake. However, instead of rushing in for the attack, the new Scipio took the remainder of that year to thoroughly train his 30,000 infantry and 3,000 cavalry. He was a different kind of Roman commander. By studying Hannibal, he also wanted to use the great potential that fast movement and the cooperation between various units on the battlefield could offer and he knew that only a well-trained and disciplined army could accomplish this. By 209, he felt that he was ready. He sent out reconnaissance and discovered that the Carthaginians were well dispersed. Hasdrubal was at Toledum, Mago was at Gades, and Gisco was fighting the tribes of Lusitania. But most importantly, he noted that all of these forces were over a 10-day march to their capital. And so Scipio decided to go after Carthago Nova. He took to ship and secretly arrived at the city walls, nearly surprising the garrison of approximately 3,000. But Carthago Nova was a fortress that was well situated on a piece of land that was nearly surrounded by water. It was a very strong defensive position that resisted his first major direct assault. Yet, this first attack was only a subterfuge to distract the defenders. Scipio had learned from one of the local fishermen that the lagoon to the north of the city at certain times of the day was passable on foot. The very next day, he ordered his sub-commander, Gaius Laelius, to perform another direct attack on the southeastern side of the city. Once again, this attack was only meant to distract the defenders. And when the garrison was busy focusing on this strike, Scipio sent in an elite 
parkour of men to cross the lagoon with scaling ladders and with a quick, secretive move as men were able to breach the walls, open the gates, and New Carthage now became a Roman possession. Its vast stores of food, weapons, and armor were now Scipio's. The Carthaginians were now in a bind. They no longer had a base of operations, and the leaders of these three forces had difficulty coordinating with the others. Mago and Gisgo retreated to the west. However, Hasdrubal, the dutiful brother, took the remainder of his army and began to march to join up with Hannibal in Italy. Scipio was not going to let this pass. In 208, he ventured out from Carthago Nova to intercept Hasdrubal and managed to catch up with him to the northwest, near the city of Baikula. Hasdrubal took his forces and positioned them in a very strong defensive position that was on top of a hill surrounded on two sides by rivers. In addition, he created a fortification on top of the hill and had his men dig in. Scipio knew that his opponent's position was strong, but he also knew that time was running out as there were still two other Carthaginian armies left in Spain that could close in on his rear, so he opted to fight. To assault such a resilient position, Scipio didn't go in for a direct frontal attack as other Roman commanders might have done. Instead, he divided his army into three groups. He placed his light troops, his Vilates, in the middle, and then placed his stronger legions on opposite sides of the hill. He commanded one wing and delegated his sub-commander Lilius to command the other. He ordered his Vilates to come up the hill and harass the Carthaginian center and grab their attention. The ruse worked. Hasdrubal stayed on his hill in a fixed position, focused on the enemy ahead. He was caught completely blindsided when the two wings of Scipio's attack closed in on him from two sides. Despite holding the high fortified ground, Hasdrubal had no option but to flee. The Roman troops unfortunately broke rank and began to start pillaging the Carthaginian camp. As a result, Hasdrubal and most of his men managed to escape. Hasdrubal would eventually follow in his brother's footsteps by crossing Gaul, the Alps, and entering Italy. However, the Romans were ready for him. In northern Italy, several Roman legions converged on his force, and at the Battle of Metaurus, he was defeated and killed. The Carthaginians, over the course of the next year, began to pour in troops in a desperate play to recapture their lost holdings in Spain. Scipio at this time traveled back to Taraka, where he began hiring mercenaries as well to bolster his forces. A confrontation was inevitable. In the year 206, after several smaller skirmishes and confrontations, Mago and Gisco joined their forces together to wield an army that was nearly 75,000 strong. They were determined to drive the young Roman commander from Hispania. Scipio brought in his own forces, which were approximately 50,000. He was outnumbered, but not intimidated. Several miles from the city of Hispalis, which is the modern-day city of Seville, the two forces met on a broad, open plain with hills to the north and south where the two armies respectively camped. For several days, the two hosts would assemble on the field and stare one another down, neither side making a move. They were observing the composition of their opponent, and testing the other's resolve, Scipio made it a point to place his veteran legions in the center with his weaker mercenaries on the flanks and with the cavalry on the extreme ends. He showed up like this every day, day after day, in the same formation and noted that the Carthaginians lined up exactly in the same pattern. Their best troops were in the center, weaker troops on the flanks, and the cavalry and the elephants on both ends. But Scipio refused to engage until he was absolutely sure that his master plan was going to work. That fateful day finally came. Before the sun rose, Scipio awoke his men and had them fill themselves with food and water. He marched them out early into formation on the battlefield and then sent some javelin throwers and some of his cavalry to attack the enemy camp. They didn't do much damage. They weren't intended to. Rather, they were just a wake-up call. The Carthaginians, fearing that they were about to be attacked, rushed into formation themselves, but in their hurry, they bypassed having any breakfast. That's right, no food, no water. 
They took up the same formation that they had the last few days. It became almost an ingrained move at this point. Scipio was happy to see this. He knew that his opponents had gotten somewhat lazy. He held his position and only sent out skirmishers to keep the enemy pinned on the field. It wasn't until hours later when the sun had come up that the Carthaginians realized that the Roman formation was now completely different. Scipio, like Hannibal at Cannae, had taken his weakest mercenary units and placed them in the center with his stronger legions on either flank. But of course, for the Carthaginians, it was too late to make any changes. Scipio was in no hurry as the day wore on and the effects of missing their food began to be felt for the Carthaginian army, Scipio decided to finally spring into action. He commanded his light troops, the skirmishers, to fall back and get into formation at the extreme flanks. He then had his entire line move towards the enemy, but not at the same pace. He had his weaker Iberian mercenaries march slowly towards the Carthaginian center. They weren't meant to attack the enemy, rather just hold their attention and keep them in place. His two wings, which were composed of his Roman legions, on the other hand, started marching at a much faster speed. The Carthaginians, despite seeing this happen, were weakened by thirst and lack of food and only walked slowly forward. When the Roman legions were within about a quarter mile of their opponents, they came to a stop. It was then that the discipline that Scipio had enforced began to show. His left flank, thousands of men in unison, turned 90 degrees to their left and began marching parallel to the enemy line. His right flank did the exact same thing, but in the opposite direction. And by doing this, his men were able to extend the front line till both Roman wings had outflanked their opponents. The Carthaginians looked on with disbelief. They were stunned that such a feat was even possible or dared to be done in such close proximity to an adversary. On Scipio's order, both wings turned 90 degrees to once again see their enemies face to face and then they rushed in for the attack. On the extreme flanks, Scipio's cavalry attacked the elephants with javelins, making them panic and run back into their own lines. Shortly thereafter, the Roman legions, the veterans of Scipio's line, smashed into the weaker units of the Carthaginian flanks. The stronger units that Mago and Gisco had placed in the center were unable to do anything or move to assist their comrades because the Roman mercenaries were still slowly bearing down on them and they were transfixed in place. But by then it was too late. Both flanks were now smashed in and the Punic line began to buckle and then disintegrate into a rout. It was only a massive downpour that stopped the slaughter but the Romans kept up the pursuit and were able to catch up with those who fled from the field and then annihilated them. It was later recorded that nearly 50,000 troops were either killed or captured. With this great victory, Scipio had smashed the Carthaginian hold on Hispania for good. He returned to Rome and in 205 was elected one of the youngest consuls in Roman history. But by now, the strategic scene of the Second Punic War had changed dramatically. Philip V had been defeated in Macedonia. Rome had restored order to the Po River Valley, Corsica, and Sardinia. In Sicily, a Roman legion had managed to sneak into Syracuse while its inhabitants were intoxicated in the middle of a giant festival. They captured the city and killed the enigmatic Archimedes. Now, the Carthaginians had even lost Spain. With his victory at Alippa, Cannae had been redeemed, and Scipio had proven that he was a worthy opponent, even for the great Hannibal. Scipio was going to get that chance to go against the Carthaginian master. His next target was going to be nothing less than Carthage. Flashpoint History is dedicated to making history accessible for everyone. If you liked the video, hit that like button, subscribe, and leave your comments below. Ask yourself who was truly the better general, Hannibal or Scipio? 
Note that the Flashpoint History Podcast is also available for download. I'll post the link to make it easy to access, but please don't forget to rate and review on iTunes slash Apple Podcasts. I'd also like to take this time to thank my Patreon subscribers. It's the cool people like you that make videos like this possible. For those of you who are not subscribers yet, or if you simply enjoy the content, consider contributing on Patreon. Note that all funds go back directly into the show. Also, if you're interested in more information about the Punic Wars or ancient history in general, please check out the amazing Ancient History Encyclopedia website. All of this information will be listed in the description below. Stay tuned for next time when we shall get to the Battle of Zama and the final confrontation between House Barca and House Scipio gets decided.